from Rob Jack. So Rob is um, a professor here um, in, uh, in, in Dampt and also um, in the Department of Chemistry and he's our first speaker. So Rob, over to you. Great. Uh, so yeah, thanks Luke for setting up uh, this workshop. I think it's going to be uh, very interesting. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what to talk about because I wasn't quite sure who is the audience. Some guys, I, I guess some faces I know and some faces I don't. So can I just check? So Okay, let's do it this way. Who, who self-identifies as a physicist in the room? <laughs> okay, nearly everybody. And the, who identifies as a probabilist or a mathematician? Okay, a few. Okay, good. So I tried to make something that kind of uh, will work uh, for everybody. Uh, probably it's a bit skewed away from physics uh, in terms of the presentation, but you'll, you'll see. Uh, so I'll talk about, uh, I'll explain what these things are, um, these self-propelled particles. So I guess self-propelled particles, they do something that is sort of they don't quite do diffusion, so we could call it anomalous diffusion. But there's going to be lots of them in this talk, so, so I'm going to consider lots of interacting diffusions. Um, and uh, to get the thanks out of the way at the beginning, so uh, I'll show results with various people. So uh, Ludovic Berthier, uh, is a French uh, statistical physicist who just moved to Paris, and we had a shared student, uh, Jan Ketter, who's now in Leiden. Uh, Francesco Turci and Nigel Wilding, so Nigel's a professor in Bristol, and Francesco's faculty there now as well. Etienne Fodor was in Cambridge and now moved to Luxembourg. Uh, since already quite a lot of years. Uh, and Tal is still a postdoctoral fellow here, and uh, Mike is here, uh, as many of you probably know. Uh, okay, so that's that. So what, what will I do? So I'll give a short introduction to these self-propelled particles and what they are, and I won't really say why, much about why we're interested in them, um, but maybe that will become clear as we go. And then I decided to say, because I wasn't sure who was the audience, I decided to say a small thing about a lot of things, a short thing about a lot of things instead of going into too much detail on any one thing. So I'll kind of give a sort of overview with some numerical results, sort of saying some, some interesting, interesting things that can happen for these particles. And then I'll talk about something a bit more mathsy, which is kind of hydrodynamic limits uh, for lattice models, which is a sort of review of other people's work. And then I'll say something about what we've done uh, with these kinds of models. And then I'll end. So it's a bit more sort of nominology and then a bit more sort of mathsy. Uh, that's the plan. And uh, I heard what Luke said, but if you do have kind of questions to clarify what the hell I'm talking about, then it's better to ask them in the middle, I think. Um, so just feel free. Okay, so, so what is the active matter story? So, well, the physicists know this already. So active matter's been a big story in physics in the last bit more than 10 years, maybe 15 years. Uh, and people are interested in systems where we have particles or agents and they consume energy in order to do something in their environment, which might well be moving around. And then they have interesting individual behavior and they have interesting collective behavior. Uh, so what do people think of? So at this point, it's traditional to show a picture of a flock of birds. But uh, I don't like to show a picture of a flock of birds. But it's not difficult to see kind of crowds and shoals of fish. Just imagine, right? Active, active agents kind of interacting together. Uh, or you can think about, at the microscopic level, you could think about bacteria swimming around in some sort of group. Or you could think at the really microscopic level, Inside the cell, you have some filaments and some motors that are you know, controlling the cytoskeleton and doing some interesting things. So this all kind of lives in the active matter umbrella. And what I'm going to talk about today is this particular class of models, physics models, I guess, statistical physics models, of self-propelled particles, which I'm sort of talking about as sort of prototypical models for really for non-equilibrium statistical physics. So I'm not going to say anything about flocks of birds or even motor proteins. We're studying these models because they have interesting behavior that emerges when we study them as physicists. And maybe, you know, maybe some insights can be taken back into the biological context, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. So what kind of models do we have? <clears throat> so we're going to have n particles, and every particle is going to have some position in, for example, two dimensions. Uh, so it's going to be particle i times t, and then it lives in some finite, usually it lives in some finite periodic simulation box. And then it moves around by what the physicists would call the Langevin equation, so that's what most of us call the Langevin equation, which I've written here as a stochastic differential equation, whatever, it doesn't matter. So this is the position, how it changes in time, and it changes according to three terms. Uh, there's some Brownian noise with strength t, which in physics would be the temperature. Uh, there's some interaction potential which gives rise to forces between the particles, which basically enforces that they don't like to overlap with each other. So we have particles, think of them as circles in 2D, and basically they don't like to interact, and that's enforced by this term here. And then we, then we have our self-propulsion force, 
uh, which is this UIT, which is going to act, it's going to be our active force, it's going to propel our particles in some direction, in some interesting way. And if there is no self-propulsion force, then this is an equilibrium system with a Boltzmann distribution as steady state. Uh, and we know what to do with those kinds of models since, I don't know, a long time. Uh, but generically, it's not a reversible model, so not reversible in the probabilistic sense, uh, non-equilibrium in the physics sense. And so we don't know, for example, much about the invariant measure of this model. If, even if I tell you what the self-propulsion force is, which I haven't yet, but just imagine it's some random force which does something, uh, then if it's non-trivial, then we generally won't know what the invariant measure is of this thing, and we don't know much about what's going to go on in this steady state. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so here's a picture just to get us uh, thinking about what's going on. So these ones, these particular type of active particles are called active Brownian particles. And what that means, I don't know why it's in this order, is that the self-propulsion force has some fixed strength. So this is a vector with fixed length and an orientation which randomly changes in time. And the persistence time for the orientation is, is this tau. I'll, I'll say more about what this means in a minute, but that's just to give you the idea. And then apart from that, we have thermal noise and we have repulsive interactions and we have this persistent self-propulsion. So what does the persistent self-propulsion mean? It means that if you follow one of the particles like this one, then it tends to be going, or at least trying to be going, in the same direction for a while. So it's persistently going sort of to the right. And actually the color tells you what direction it's sort of persistently going. And then it has a little collision and so it can't anymore. And then eventually if you wait long enough, this movie's not long enough, but if you wait long enough, then they'll all forget their orientations and they'll start going in a new direction. And if you're familiar with these kinds of models, then you think, well, okay, I've got a repulsive interaction potential, I've got thermal noise, probably my particles should just all spread out and do whatever they want. But what you see is that it looks very lumpy. If you're used to looking at equilibrium systems, this looks very lumpy, it looks very clustery. There's this sort of big cluster of particles, kind of like this, and uh, that's not coming from any interact, that's not coming from any attractive interactions between the particles, it's coming from the activity. So that's kind of the first interesting thing that we can say about these active systems, the self-propulsion causes dynamical clustering. Okay, so let's say a bit more about this then. So, so what is this self-propulsion force? There are different choices. So th the examples we're going to consider today, all the UIs are, so they're going to be random, and they're going to be independent of each other, and they're going to be independent of the positions. So in some sense, you can just think about them as some sort of colored noise. This is just some sort of random force which interacts. Um, but typically it has a correlation time. So this is the autocorrelation function of this random vector, uh, and it has a correlation time tau, and it has a strength d naught, roughly speaking. And what that means is that it's not just a white noise, right? They tend to swim in the same direction. They tend to be propelled in the same direction for quite a long time, especially if tau is large. And the common choices specifically for the dynamics are this thing which is called active orsin ullenbeck particles, because this is an orsin ullenbeck process, or active Brownian particles where this UT has a fixed length uh, and a random angle. So if you know this already, then it's all very boring to you. And if you don't know it already, I wouldn't suggest to try and uh, internalize all the details of this equation. Just, just remember this, right? So it's, it's something which propels you in the same direction for a while and eventually forgets what's going on. Uh, good. And I didn't put here, there is the famous RTP as well. Um, but if you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. Well, it might be a good model for E. coli. That would be an interesting reason to think about it. Okay, so this I kind of already said that what this activity does is it causes particles to cluster together. And the reason is simple. If you tend to go persistently in one direction and you find yourself in front of a wall, then you will stop there for a while. And that tends to slow you down. And then other particles will arrive behind you and they'll also stop. And you get this dynamical clustering effect. So it's got nothing to do with attractive forces, it's just to do with the fact that they like to go in the same direction. And this is not a very big system, so this was from some simulations that we did uh, with Takahiro Nomoto and so on. Um, but if you do a big simulation, uh, then you really see very clearly that you end up, so this is from one of the big numerical papers that kicked off the active matter business in 2012. I mean, I'll say something about that in a minute, but um, what you see very clearly is there's one macroscopic cluster with a, a vapor around it. And if you made this system box twice as big again, the big cluster would get twice as big. And so it's a macroscopic, macroscopic cluster. And this. So the, the colors are now the speed. 
These colours, uh, it's probably the number of neighbours, isn't it? Look, there's a little grey guys who are no neighbours, and green guys. I suspect there's a number of neighbours. Uh, and this idea was already in models uh, from Mike and Julian, so one from before, but around this time, people started doing these large-scale simulations and really seeing this collective behaviour, and it kind of became very popular. But it's already, you know, anyway, never more. Okay, so what's going on? So for many particles, okay, right, so, so that's, that's that. So you have this motility-induced phase separation, which is a proper phase separation. Uh, and this resembles, if you know about this stuff, this resembles a lot the physics of liquid vapor condensation. So it resembles what's happening in clouds, uh, where liquid condenses out of the vapor. And it's coming from this persistent propulsion, which leads to this effective attraction in the sense that you arrive in front of another particle and you block each other and then you stick there for a while. Uh, and that leads to this clustering and this phase separation. And then the sort of question that, so once you've understood that this happens, which is already interesting and important, then you say, okay, well, we understand liquid vapor phase separation. Is this just a new version of that, or is there something different going on? And the answer is that there's a lot of similarities, but there are also important differences, and important differences of what we like to think about. Okay. So that was the sort of general introduction. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is talk about uh, some more recent things that we've been doing. I'm just talking about things that we've been doing because they're what I know about. Lots of other people are doing interesting things too. Um, but I'll just talk about some interesting simulations that we did recently uh, to give a sense of what's the phenomenology when you have many of these interacting active particles. And then I'll talk a little bit more about mathy stuff uh, later. Okay, so you've got, we've got these fluids of active particles. Are they like equilibrium fluids or not? That's, that's kind of the question. Uh, and then you can ask in different regimes, right? So you can ask in this regime, is it like it? In this regime, is it like it? Whatever. So one thing that you could ask is, what about crowded systems? So in crowded systems at high density, equilibrium, behave, equilibrium fluids do interesting things, including the glass transition. And with Ludovic Berthier, we worked a lot on the glass transition and also separately. Um, uh, and so we were sort of interested in what would happen to the glassy behavior in the active system. So you can make a phase diagram. So what did we do here? So we, we took the uh, AOUP models, it doesn't say, but it's AOUP, uh, and we vary the persistence time and the concentration of these particles, uh, and then there's another parameter, which is this D naught, and that one's fixed. Okay, don't worry about it too much. Uh, and then there's no Brownian noise on these positional equations, it turns out. So we took the equations without positional noise, but there's randomness that comes in through the, through the orientation, through the dynamics for U. And then you map out the phase diagram, so this is what people do in physics a lot. So up this axis is the persistence time or the noise, and along this one is the concentration, and the model is set up such that you get back equilibrium when you make the persistence time very short. Because if you make the persistence time short enough, you just get back a Brownian noise, and it's scaled in such a way that you get it at finite temperature. And so down here we have traditional equilibrium physics where we have a fluid phase, and then at very high density it dynamically rests because the particles can't move anymore, and they just block each other and nothing interesting. And then up here we have this motility induced phase separation, which I spoke about before, uh, which is kind of well known. And then we were interested in what would happen uh, around here uh, when the liquid phase of the, of the motility induced phase separation starts to hit dynamical arrest and so on. Um, and what I didn't say yet, but I'll probably say on the next slide, is that uh, if you just do this experiment, if you just make this phase diagram for a sort of typical bunch of active particles, then they will crystallize. So crystallization is another thing that can happen in equilibrium systems, and it does happen here, but we made it polydispersed. So we made it, you can see this is a picture of the system. You can see there are some big ones and some small ones. Um, it's continuous polydispersity with big and small, uh, and that's enough to prevent crystallization, and then you can study the, and that's well known for the glass transition. If you want to study the glass transition, you need to make it polydispersed. So here's a movie of, uh, of the active fluid close to the glass transition moderately close to the glass transition. So yes, it looks kind of, it makes you feel a bit sick actually, doesn't it? You can see that there's kind of some sort of collective motion going on here, but particles are keeping their neighbors for quite a long time. So this is sort of slow dynamics in the glassy sense, even though, there's, even though particles are moving around a bit. If you look at whether they hold on to their neighbors or not, and how frequently the local structure rearranges, then this is getting towards the glassy regime. Uh, and then in this sort of glassy fluids where crowded fluids where dynamics is very collective, 
people talk about this, this phenomenon of dynamical heterogeneity, which is how is the motion correlated between particles that are nearby. And uh, we illustrated this with this velocity map. So these are the velocities now. So these are really the velocities, not the propulsion forces. These are the velocities of the particles. And uh, what's going on? They're colored by the length. And then there is little vectors for the direction as well, if you can see it. And what you see is that it's, it's very highly correlated. So here, there are a bunch of particles which are actually going in the same direction and all have large velocities. And here, they're basically all stationary. Uh, and if you know about equilibrium and you think about it for a minute, this, there are strictly no correlations in this picture for equilibrium. So velocities and equilibrium are strictly uncorrelated. So this is a distinct type of correlation which appears in these active glass, which is completely unheard of at equilibrium. And it's a sort of new class of dynamical heterogeneity, and we wrote about it in this paper. So, so it's just to say, you know, the glassy physics, the physics of the crowded active fluid is different from the physics of the crowded equilibrium fluid. And that's one of the kind of things that people like to think about in this phenomenology business. Yeah, and you said something about, sorry, for the dispersity. So you said if you, you couldn't get to this glassy region if it was monodispersed? It would crystallize if it was monodispersed. And then it does, I mean, then it arrests, but for a different reason, right? Then, it, then it's arrested. But, but this kind of behavior, you wouldn't, well, okay, the active crystal is also interesting, huh? I mean, people have also studied the active crystal. That's also interesting. Is it because you need the smaller particles to kind of fill in the gaps? Um, that's kind of uh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you try and build a crystal, if you try and build a crystal from pennies, it's quite easy. Yeah. And if you try and build a crystal from a mixture of pennies and two p's and five p's, good luck. I mean, it's, I think it's just that. It's just packing. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so this is velocity correlations. But they're not really, well, yeah, I didn't choose the best movie, but... This paper was about velocity correlations, really, and about uh, short-scale movement. And then we got interested in kind of how far these velocities actually add vect the particles. So there is this business in these active suspensions of bacteria, for example, called active turbulence, which says that you get actually flows as well. You actually get what they call chaotic advection. So you get flows of particles that travel around a long distance. Uh, and so this is the movie. So I just like this movie. I wanted to show this movie, really. So what you see is that so you, we just color them according to their initial positions. So they, they, there's no physics in the color. Uh, and then you just let it mix itself, right? So it's a fluid, so eventually it will mix. But you see it mixes in this rather chaotic way where you get these kind of streamers develop where these particles kind of get advected by these chaotic, by these uh, random correlated flows. And this stuff is all quite familiar in systems where the self-propulsion forces like to align with each other. So if you have the UIs tend to align, then you very naturally get kind of local patches of aligned velocity. And what's interesting here is that without any orientational alignment terms, we still see this kind of correlated flows along the same direction. And the reason has to do with sort of the normal modes of the crystal, or the normal modes of the, of the crowded, dense packing, I think. So there are sort of normal modes along which flow is kind of rather easily occurs. And those are the directions along the energy landscape, if you want, along which motion happens. And that's what gives rise to this, uh, this advective flows in systems without any explicit alignment. Because you know, in, if you think of the previous picture with the velocity correlations, th there's no alignment. So why do these velocities correlate? Well, it's to do with the fact that there are soft directions on the landscape along which they align. OK. So I said to you I was going to say kind of a small thing about a lot of things. So that's all I'm going to say about the glassy business. Um, and now I'm going to say something about something, something else. But it's just to sort of maybe catch your attention and maybe if someone can ask me a question about something that they were interested in at, during the coffee or whatever. Uh, so let's go back to MIPS. So this was the, the, the motility induced phase separation picture I showed uh, with the macroscopic phase separated cluster and everything around it. And we're coming back to this question of does this stuff behave like, uh, does this stuff behave like a fluid, an equilibrium fluid, or not? Uh, so one thing we know about fluids is that uh, fluids with liquid vapor, that is, is that if you put them near a wall, you can get wetting and drying. So that's what we did in this paper with, uh, with Nigel Wilding and Francesco Tucci. Uh, so these are 3D simulations, but the third direction is quite small. So it's just average over the third direction. So I'm showing 2D pictures of a 3D system because um, it helps to kill off the fluctuations a bit. Uh, and here, there is a wall. Well, we call it a wall, but it's penetrable. So it's like a finite wall that the particles can kind of what I want to say, they can kind of make their way over the wall if they've got someone pushing behind and they can kind of, so that it's possible for them to penetrate the wall, but they don't really like to do it. And when you do that, uh, you get this cluster of the, of the liquid phase, if you want, 
that develops on the inside of this wedge-shaped wall. And it's not the best. I don't know. I thought the image was better than this. But it, if you look at the shape of this, of this and the, this, this is the density. The color is the density. So if you look at the shape of this cluster, you see that it's kind of quite well described by an arc of a circle. And then you can identify a sort of contact angle uh, that the fluid develops with the wall. And of course, in equilibrium, Young's equation tells you that the contact angle is determined by the surface tensions, the three surface tensions between the liquid, the vapor, and the wall. And then the question is, what happens to this picture if you go away from equilibrium? And the answer is, I think, well, it's not very clear. Still. Uh, but you would, sort of, you would sort of hope that some version of this equation might still hold. And there are a couple of proposals, I would say, but I would, I don't, in my opinion, it's not settled. If Julien was here, he would probably tell you it's settled. Um, OK, so, let, so let's just look at the data then. So if we do an equilibrium simulation, so we just take an equilibrium fluid, Leonard Jones, something like that. Uh, there's a red wall here. So it's, the wall is on the edge of the box here before it was in the middle. But, so there's a red wall here. Uh, it's in 3D, quite a big simulation. This is 20 diameters. Uh, and then you measure the density. And then as a function of the, some sort of parameter of the wall, this is actually how attractive the wall is, uh, then you see that the contact angle kind of changes smoothly, and eventually the fluid wets at the wall. So at some point here, the contact angle has gone from being, what's it there about? Um, gone from being about 60 degrees there to being about zero degrees here. And that's the wetting transition is when the contact angle goes to zero. OK, so that's what happens in equilibrium. And it's, it's quite complicated, the equilibrium theory of wetting, but it is basically understood. Um, and then, so then we said, well, what happens in the active case? We do the same simulation, roughly speaking. But as I said, we take a penetrable wall instead of a hard wall. And this parameter here, this epsilon parameter, instead of being the stickiness of the wall, it is the penetrability of the wall. So the walls are getting less penetrable as we go from here to here. So you can see here, this is basically a hard wall. This is basically a penetrable wall. And you can see that you kind of get the same physics again. You get this contact angle that looks quite well defined. And it kind of smoothly increases until eventually the whole thing becomes wet. So the contact angle is probably about zero here. Um, these simulations are quite difficult because they need quite big boxes and the fluctuations are big. So that's why you don't see everything as clearly as here. And then there is also this white stuff, which hopefully you can tell what's going on. And the white stuff really tells you what's different in the active system, which is that the white stuff is the average current as a function of position. So these active particles, they swim. So if, on average, the particles here are swimming to the left, then, or to the right, whatever, to the right. On average, the particles here are swimming to the right, so you get this kind of jet of particles, which is kind of constantly disappearing out of the right-hand side of this wedge, and here. And that's, again, strictly forbidden in equilibrium, so there can't be any flows in equilibrium spontaneously at steady state, by definition, because it's time reversible invariant, time reversible. Um, but here you do. And so, it seems sort of logical that if we really wanted to have a good theory of this contact angle stuff, we would probably have to take care of this wetting business. And by the way, the flow depends on the opening angle of this wedge, right? So if you make this wedge a big wedge or a small wedge, you'll get a different flow. But in equilibrium, you'd always have the same contact angle. So in equilibrium, the contact angle is determined locally by the surface tensions. In non-equilibrium, that doesn't have to be the case. It could be that it's determined by locally. So, so, the, so the least droplets this is the steady state. So they are arriving. So they're, so they're leaving here, but they are arriving here. So, so there's a, there's a, it's a divergence free. The white field is divergence free. Why, why do you need to change the position of the wall? Um, so that comes back. To, so, there, so there are these nice papers by Nigel and Francesco where they say that an impenetrable wall is always wet. For the reason that I said, when I walk towards the wall, particles accumulate at the wall like crazy. So if you want to get a hard wall to dry, that's difficult. Now, other people say that you can do it, actually. If you make, if you make the wall very squidgy and you do the right thing, you can actually get a, a, a dry wall. But certainly for, unless the wall is very squidgy, it, it won't work. Uh, So this is phenomenology, right? I mean, this is data. And I think, it's, I think there's a lot to understand still here. And uh, yeah, 
I think there's a lot, lot to understand here, and, and one would have to dig into the details probably. Different models might not behave the same. These are AVPs, who knows what, uh, what models do. Or one can address it from a kind of field theoretic point of view, a sort of active model B point of view or something like that, and ask the same question, but then you might lose some of this information uh, to do with how the density field couples to the wall. So, so uh, you know, I think there's, there are open questions around here which could be interesting um, almost from the fluidity angle as well as from the statistical physics angle and so on. Um, so this is showing the cosine of the contact angle uh, which we measured as a function of the wall parameter and you see that uh, um, it does what you'd expect, right? As you change the parameter in the appropriate way, it goes to being wetter and wetter and drier and drier. And in the wetting business, one of the interesting questions is whether this comes in, I always get this wrong. I think the interesting question is whether this comes in with finite slope or flat, like a quadratic, and that's like continuous versus discontinuous wetting. Uh, and you can see that these seem to be uh, coming in with finite slope. And then down here, there's also what's called the drying transition, where the contact angle goes to 180 degrees, and the circular droplet detaches from the wall. And, and you don't get that transition in a clear way for these simulations. And I don't quite remember why. I think we did understand why. But in, in Ising-like models, everything is perfectly symmetric between wetting and drying. And the asymmetry between wetting and drying is something that even in equilibrium hasn't been studied, equilibrium fluids, hasn't been studied as much as you might think. So there are recent papers by Nigel saying that there are very, really important differences between wetting and drying transitions if you take real particles instead of ising type models. But anyway, so that's just, yeah. Okay. So what, so you know, so we have this data, so it's like, well, what, what's the first thing to try with this data? Uh, so I'll just show you what we tried. I don't think this is the whole story, but it seemed like a sensible starting point. So, so this is my model now of my droplet. So it has a contact point, which is this circle. Let's take the greenish line. It has a contact point with this circle, it has another contact point, with this, which is this circle, and then it has a contour length. So this distance here is D1 and D2, so that's the lengths over which the droplet's in contact with the wall, and L is the boundary of the droplet. And then let's just suppose, for no good reason, well, no, let's suppose by analogy with equilibrium that the probability of a particular shape, like this green shape here, is given by some surface tension times the length in contact with the wall plus some con surface tension times the... Okay, I'll, there's a mistake, I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, okay, so the probability depends on this length, d1 plus d2, and this length, L. So this is the contour length uh, of the liquid vapor interface and this is the length of the liquid wall interface. And then these two things are the wrong way around, aren't they? So apologies for that. So uh, this one should be delta gamma and this one should be gamma. Uh, that's what this says. And then if you just assume this, then the most likely shape gives you some version of Young's equation. Uh, so I don't know. That's, that, that seemed like to us to be the sort of sensible place to start thinking about this, even though we don't imagine this is the full story because everything is local here and there are these current fields, which in principle are introducing non-local correlation. But let's just put this model up against the data and see what it tells us. Uh, so what Francesco Tucci did was he said, well, we'll take this model, we'll take our density profiles from the simulations, and we'll just sort of do what we have to do to fit uh, the mean density. So you take a statistical theory, this is a property distribution, so you take a statistical theory for this contour L, uh, and then you kind of match the parameters such that the model matches, fits the density profile of the, uh, of the simulation. And that's not too difficult to do, right? You can imagine there's enough parameters here to get these kind of circular shaped droplets. So no big deal. I mean, how exactly you get the, get the continuous density profile across the interface, that's not so clear. But then for a non-trivial test of the model, what you can do is you can say, well, now I know this. So what about the density fluctuations, right? Because as the interface moves, like as this point on the interface moves, the density is going to fluctuate between the vapor density and the liquid density. So you can measure in the simulations the variance of the density as a function of position, and you can measure that from the model as well. And you can see that over here it seems to do all right, so it gets, a, gets qualitatively right that the biggest fluctuations happen uh, next to the wall. Uh, but over here it seems to be not working. Um, okay, I think we did have a reason why this might be. I think, okay, I think the reason for this might just be that uh, in this picture the kind of 
contact point is almost at the end of the wall. And then obviously things are going to change. So the theory assumes an infinite wall. And here we've got finite walls. These are all finite simulation boxes and so on. So, um, so uh, there we go. So, so that's, that, that's, and we're calling this a sort of statistical theory because this is a statistical definition of a non-equilibrium surface tension. It's the formula we correct, we're correct it would be. So this is a statistical way to define some sort of surface tension uh, for these systems. And uh, Julien and Fred and Yarif Kafri and various other people uh, have a very recent paper which pursues an alternative way to think about surface tension uh, in these systems, which is to think about it mechanically. So surface in equilibrium, you have mechanical forces associated with surface tension, and you also have statistical fluctuations associated with surface tension. And those two surface tension definitions have to give you the same number by the magic of equilibrium. But in non-equilibrium, that's not the case. So this is, this is the statistical surface tension. They have the mechanical surface tension. They also have, I think, some analog of Young's equation, but it's different. But this, this one is not the full story, as I said to you. So, to be understood, I would say. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about phenomenology. Uh, now I want to say something about kind of more mathy things. Um, I'm just trying to work out what I'm doing with time. So I think when I started, I think it was 100 and, it was 66 minutes. <coughs> what time should I finish? I mean, you, you, have, you have lots of I know I have lots of time, but what time should I finish? <laughs> um, let's say, yeah, 10.30. 10.30, perfect. That sounds good. Great. Okay, so let's talk about, a bit about what we can do. Instead of doing simulations, let's think a bit about what we can do with equations. So for that, we have to, let's first simplify the model. Uh, so we'll put it on a lattice, because we know what to do with lattice models, and probabilists know also what to do with lattice models, so that's good. Uh, so... Here we have a 1D lattice, and we have some particles on that lattice, and they are labeled of two colors. So there's the purple particle and the, what is that, cyan particle. And the, these are plus particles, actually. There's a plus sign here, and these are minus particles. And there is at most one particle per site, so it's an exclusion process. Uh, and the particles are going to hop around on the lattice. And in particular, you know, well, maybe you don't know, but th this particle is going to hop to an empty site with rate D. And additionally, these two particles, they can swap places with rate d. And that turns out to be important for the maths. Uh, so, you know, if you think about them as physical swimmers, they probably can't pass through each other. But in this model, they can swap places with rate d. And it's the same rate, these d's are the same d. And then they can also change color, and they change color from minus to plus or plus to minus with rate gamma over L squared. And L is the number of lattice sites. We'll get there. So, so that's, the, that's the rate with which they change color. And then finally, the minus guys, they slightly prefer to hop left than to hop right. And the difference between the left hop rate and the right hop rate is this lambda over L. So basically the left hop rate is E minus lambda over L and the right hop rate, the plus is, sorry, the other way around, D plus lambda over L to the left, and the purples go D plus lambda over L to the right. Okay, if you didn't understand those things, just remember, the minus ones like to go left, the plus ones like to go right, but it's only a small difference. So this model uh, comes from this paper uh, by Julien Tailleur uh, and uh, Mohamed Kouen Hussain, who I think, uh, yeah, so they did, they, they I think are physicists, basically. Uh, and then Thierry Bodineau and uh, Clément Erenu are, I think, the mathematicians. Uh, and you'll see uh, how it worked. Uh, but they introduced this model uh, with this scaling of the rates. Okay, this is what I already said. So the division constant D, Self-propulsion pr force is this lambda, and then they change direction with rate gamma, except that it's the scale length of the length of this number of lattice sites. And then if you just simulate this model, you know, what are you going to do? Simulate the model. So this is in 1D, but you can, you can imagine quite easily how it's going to be different in 2D. It's just going to be, there's still only two species in 2D. Uh, so what you see is that this thing does this motility induced phase separation business that I was talking about off lattice. So in the continuum, you get this phase separation. In the lattice model, you still get it. And what you see here is that the red particles, which are the purple ones, they pile up on the left, and the blue particles pile up on the right. So we are in the correct political alignment. And uh, that's that. Um, and in the middle, you don't really see it here, but in the middle there is a well-defined bulk region uh, where there's equal numbers of, of red and blue. So it looks a bit like it's a sort of continuous 
change from red to blue, but there should be a bulk region in the middle uh, where it's flat. Okay, so then you go to your mathematical friends and you say, well, what should we do? We'll take the limit L tends to infinity, we'll put this circle in a fixed domain, for example, let's make it the unit circle, and then we pile our, we, we squeeze our L lattice sites into the unit circle, say, and then we speed up time by L squared so that this rate becomes one and this rate uh, becomes fast enough that we still make progress on the unit circle in finite time. So if you think about it for a minute, that's the right thing to do. Uh, and then what you'd really like is some equation which tells you how the density of the two kinds of particles changes in time. So what you want is some sort of PDE for the densities of plus and minus particles. And it turns out that you can derive it exactly for this model, uh, and this is what it looks like. So when you zoom out and you look at the particles not individually, but as a density, then you see that they obey something which looks a bit like a diffusion equation, so this would be a diffusion equation for the plus particles. And then here we've got a drift which says that the plus particles like to go to the right, as we said. Uh, and here we've got the tumbling, which says that there's no gradient in front of this one, right? So this one tells you that particles can spontaneously, particles of plus type can be spontaneously created, uh, and that's associated with, well, not created from vacuum, but created from minus particles. Um, and there's a nonlinearity in here, uh, which comes from the fact that, I didn't really say this, but um, when we do the swapping, we don't have any lambda. So when particles swap places, they don't care whether they're plus or minus particles, the rates are just the same, but when they hop through an empty region, that's when they care whether they are plus particles or minus particles in terms of the asymmetry of their diffusion. So that's just how the model is. And for this, you know, to prove this, you have to go to the book of Kipnis Landim and then you have to do some, you know, some lookup. But it's kind of established maths, I think, to do this. But it is rigorous and it is exact. And uh, this is easily generalized to two dimensions and you can generalize it to you know, more than two orientations. You can have an up particle and a down particle and a left particle and a right particle. All this stuff is relatively easy, I would say. You just, the equations are what you would guess. And then there is the interesting question of, in 2D, what if these particles can't swap places? What if they can only travel through the vacuum but when they get meet another particle they are blocked? And that case is not easy but, uh, if you look at Clement's thesis, then you will discover that it's possible. So what Clement always says is, you know, this calculation is like a 10-page supplementary information, and this calculation is like a 100-page PhD thesis. So this is, you know, mathematically, I think, state-of-the-art probably. Um, but it can be done, and you can, once you've got the equations, you don't care how you derive them. You can just analyze them. And Maria will talk about that. Uh, good. Uh -huh. So... How do the equations look in case D for people? There are nonlinearities everywhere. Uh, Maria will show them. Uh, yes, good. Um, so phenomenology then, so we have these uh, parameters, the diffusion, the drift, and the tumbling. We embed our L lattice sites on a torus, and now let's make the circle of fixed length L, which is one before. Then the behavior depends on this Peclet number, which is somehow how much they drift. So the Peclet number is the ratio of the drift to the diffusion, basically. So the concentration, and then there's this non-trivial system size parameter, which, once you de-dimensionalize everything, enters in this way. And uh, so, okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, but the, the easy parameters to understand are the Peclet number and the volume fraction. And then here's the phase separation again. This is from their paper still. Uh, that they started off the system with this arbitrary density profile, and then they ran propagated time forward. I think there's two lines here. There's the simulation with the particles and there's the sort of solving the PDE and you don't see two lines because they are on top of each other. I mean, it's a theorem, so it better work. Um, well, I guess the system is large. I mean, it's a theorem for large systems and it's a simulation for finite systems, but even so. And then what's the physics of this parameter? So here you sort of see that there's an interface between, so there's, the, I said to you before, right? There's a bulk region where it's dense and the density is close to one, but it's not one. So it looks a bit close to one, but it's definitely not one in here. There are vacancies. Yeah, there are a few vacancies in there, I promise. So the density is close to one, but it's not one. And the density is not zero here either. But there's this finite interfacial region, then two well-defined bulk regions, which is what you expect for uh, phase-phase separation. 
And then there's this, this size parameter. It turns out to be the system size divided by the interfacial width. And the interfacial width is roughly speaking you know, the distance from here to here, which is also the distance over which, which it takes to establish the bulk behavior, the well-mixed interior. Uh, so it's actually quite big. I think the interfacial region is actually about this big here. It's not, the, not, not determined by the density. It's determined by the maximum ratio. And then you can even do more. Uh, so th this, was, this was hydrodynamics, right? So this is what's called hydrodynamic limit, those equations which I showed you. Um, so as far as physics is concerned, what I'm going to show you is true, even though I don't believe it's, the theorem has been proved. Uh, so you can get the fluctuations around the hydrodynamic limit. So what do we know? We know that the, di the, the we know that the differential equation for the plus species is going to be some current type term, which is from the particles swimming and diffusing, plus some reaction term, which is from the particles changing color. And this one is a divergence, because it's conserved, and this one's not a divergence, because it's the color change. But this one's plus k, and this one's minus k, because the total number of plus and minus is conserved. Okay? So we know the equations have to have this shape. And then, if you, just re if you just ignore the noises here, you'll just get back the equation which I gave you before, which is the hydrodynamic equation. What I want to tell you is that if you want to get the first correction to the hydrodynamic behavior in order to understand fluctuations around the hydrodynamic limit deterministic equations, then you can do that. And these noises which appear in these three equations, they are all different. They have non-trivial structure inside them. These ones are Gaussian, and this one's not even Gaussian. Um, but in principle, everything is known, uh, even if not proven. And they're all small, because if you zoom out enough, you should expect to see deterministic dynamics, just as you would for diffusion equation, and indeed you do. So there are small noises on hydrodynamic scales, but they are known what they are. Uh, and so this is some sort of small noise, stochastic PDE, if you want. I mean, really, it's, it really, it's a large deviation principle in small noise sense. But, and, and for the experts, this is not active model B, which is what you might have expected to get, because we've specifically chosen this tumble rate to be very small, so we've got two densities in our PDE instead of one. So we've got the left movers and the right movers in our equation. Whereas in active model B, you would have only the total density, and the polarization would have been adiabatically eliminated. Um, so as far as I know, there is, should be careful. I don't think there's any rigorous way to derive active model B from a particle model, but there, this is rigorous, at least. This is exact, let's say. I believe it could be rigorous. Memo says to me. And this, I think this, uh, this observation came from Tal and uh, Yariv and Vivian, who realized by mapping to the ABC model that uh, this should work. OK. So that was a sort of, none of that was, was, was uh, our results. We have results a bit like that, some of which Marie will talk about. Um, but uh, I'm not going to talk about them much. Um, so I want to slightly switch gears again and talk about this business of entry production and time reversal, and then if there's any time at the end, I'll talk about um, what we did with that. Um, but just in the interest of being general and giving a sense of ideas rather than details, I'll just talk about this for a bit. So what do people do in this business, this business of entry production and time reversal? I guess how many people I'm boring by telling them this if they know already. I think probably enough people don't know. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me just, I'll go through it quickly. So, so we have this lattice model. And if we specify the motion of all the particles on some time interval, we can call that a trajectory, or we can call it a sample path. And for every such path, we can define the probability. It's just encoded by the stochastic rules of the model, at least if we condition on the initial state. So we have our initial state comes from somewhere, and then we say, well, what's the probability to observe you know, this sample path, this, this can be written down. There's a formula for it. And there's a corresponding probability to observe the time-reversed version of the path. So if you just start with the final state, and you say, well, the particles have to move in exactly the opposite way to what I first said, then this also has a well-defined probability, except that it's conditional on, its, on the initial state of the time-reversed path, which is the final state of the forward path. So th I'm not writing any formula, but you can imagine that there is a formula. And then people like to define this thing, which I'm calling the informatic entry production rate. Some people would just call it the entry production rate, which is defined in this way. So you just take the log of the forward probability, divide it by the backwards probability, sorry, 
divide, make, make the ratio and then take the log and then divide by the total time because it's the informatic entry production rate, so you should divide by the time. And you might say, well, what if these distributions are not absolutely continuous with respect to each other or some such thing? Well, it's all fine, I promise. So there's some sort of, you know, Radon continuity thing. Um, but anyway, it, it, it's well defined. This thing's well defined. You can take this ratio and it's finite. <coughs> Um, yes. So if you have a reversible Markov chain, this thing is zero on average. And otherwise, it's positive on average, I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe, maybe I wasn't quite as precise as I meant to be about the effect of the initial condition, but just take my word for it. It's fine. It's fine. Um, so this, um, this theory goes back to the '90s, right? Um, this is an established theory. Started with this. Yeah. Just thinking about it, I think. So, so people like this quantity, the, the average. I they like it because it's a signature of non-equilibriumness. It's a signal of breaking a time reversal symmetry. Um, and then, and th this is all well understood. Right? But I think something that we were interested in is that. If you have the same system, you might define your path in a different way, and then you would get a different number for the entropy production rate. So for example, instead of considering particles, we could consider the hydrodynamic description of our model, and we could define the path as just, you know, the uh, root followed by the um, densities. And then we can identify a formula for the probability of this path, condition on its initial state, but the path is defined in a different way, right? Now the path is defined in terms of the densities instead of the other. And we've got formulae for this, because I said we have these fluctuating hydrodynamic formulae, so all is good. Uh, okay, this is my picture of what I mean. So here are some fish, and then here is, and they are swimming forward. And then here is the time reversed movie of the fish, in which they still face forwards, but they swim backwards. And you say, well, the property of this path probably is much bigger than the property of this path. So the infinite entry reduction rate should be large. Um, but that's not the only thing you could do, right? Another thing you could do is you could say, well, let me flip the orientations of the fish. So here I flip the orientations, and now they point in the opposite direction. And then I reverse time as well. And then I have this situation where in this picture, they're, they're pointing forwards. In this picture, they're still swimming forwards. So you might think, well, probably this one has roughly the same property as this one. And I can define my infinite entry reduction rate by comparing this path with this path if I want. And then you say, well, here, here there's lots of them at the front and only one straggling behind at the back, and here there's only one at the front and lots of them straggling behind at the back. So maybe actually the properties of this and this are not the same, because maybe they both be like this. So this is just to illustrate that you know, there's different ways to think about what a path is. Uh, there's different ways to think about what time reversal is. And in terms of, so this is time reversal, and in terms of the path, you know, when you write down the path, do you track the orientations or just the positions? And do you also track the internal coordinates of the fish and whether they're thinking about what they're thinking about and how fast their heart is beating. So this is just my picture of, of um, illustrating why it's interesting to think about different kinds of path for the same kind of system and different kinds of time reversal operations. Okay, so then once you realize this, you can think about some interesting questions and you, this is generic for any non equilibrium system if you want. You can think about, I've told you about the average of this informatic entry production, but is the average dominated by certain types of path? Do different degrees of freedom contribute? What about different regions? And then, so these are kind of, well, yeah. So these are kind of statements about the average, and then, you know, what about the probability to observe some non-typical value of the entry production instead of observing the average? Because it's a random variable. This thing's a random variable because it's path. Okay, so, uh, so that was just my quick introduction to what people will what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about the entropy entropy reduction, and I think at least some other people are interested in those kind of questions as well. There's lots of other questions that people are also interested in, but yeah. Uh huh. So let's go back to some some uh, to a model to answer some specific question instead of waffling in a general way. Um, this average entropy entropy reduction rate for the specific model that I showed you with the red and blue particles. Is it the same if I talk about particle paths or hydro paths? So that, I think, is a non-trivial question. 
you should be expecting that it's not the same, because if I define the path in a different way, the property is going to be different, and everything will be different. It turns out that for this model, the average entropy reduction is the same at the two levels of description. The irreversibility is only on the hydrodynamic scale in this model. And if you think about that, the reason is that uh, every particle feels a very weak asymmetry in whether it prefers to go left or right. So the particles are individually almost reversible. And then it turns out that all the, all the asymmetry, all the time reversal symmetry breaking is happening on the hydrodynamic scale once they have to go a long way before they notice that the property is any different. Uh, and this is actually what the average entropy reduction is, and it's quite a nice simple formula in the end. Um, so it's just the, you know, the drift squared, which has to be, because it has to be even in the drift. And then there's something, the number of particles is, this phi is the concentration. So the number of particles times the number of, L phi is the number of particles. Uh, D is just normalizing, and then this thing is some factor. So if lambda is zero, we have equilibrium because the particles are going equally left and right. Nothing is done, so it should be zero, and it is zero. For phi equals zero, we don't have any particles, so there's only one path, which is nothing happens, and nothing happens, that's fine. And for phi equals one, it's not obvious what's going on because we still have motion, but it turns out that the asymmetry of the drift only enters processes where you swap places with a vacancy. So I said to you, if you swap places, a red and a blue particle swap places, then that rate of that process is unaffected by lambda. Um, so, uh, Sorry, what's that? Is that, does that mean that the lambda is pretty full? Cool? Yeah, but they can still swap places. Ah, yes, They're still red and blue. Mother, you are in the model, you are yeah. the symmetric. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I mention this question is that when we first calculated it, we got a different answer, and we were like, oh yeah, we're happy, because it's different. And then we realized that our simple calculation was, was wrong, so the, the computation for the particle paths to get this result is quite quite fiddly, um, it's a sort of interesting, there's some interesting correlation effects that go on to doing this calculation, but that's fine. Um, okay, two minutes, uh, what shall I say about this? We have a bit more time than that. Well, but I think everyone's tired. Huh? Um, <laughs> let me just say two words about this, because it's something that, you know, I feel I should advertise a little bit. So, uh, this is the formula for the informatic entry production of the path. And if we think about it at a hydrodynamic level, so think about the paths followed by the density field, then this intermediate entropy reduction can be written as some sort of integral over the spatial degrees of freedom of the system and, and over the path for some function s. And then you stare at this thing for a while and you say, well, this is a time average, isn't it? It's one over tau integral zero to tau, something. And the system is ergodic, and it is for three. Uh, so for typical paths and large times, we expect the time average to converge to the ensemble average of property one. And this is true at, at particle level as well. This is just whatever it is. Um, and then you can say more, actually. You can say that the distribution of this thing, so this thing converges to this thing with property one, but there's still events where it doesn't. There's still events where you see different values. So for any finite time, there is still a distribution of this thing. And this is how the distribution behaves, that the probability that the entry production rate takes some value double w is given by this kind of formula where this i is called the rate function. Um, and this sort of lives in the sort of framework of these donska varadan large deviations, if you know. Uh, and uh, so this rate function measures how rare are paths with non-typical values of entropy reduction. And these paths have vanishing probability, so you might say, well, why do I care? Um, but I think Experience has shown that these rare paths, if you learn about them, you can get some interesting physical insights into the system. Um, and I'm not going to tell you all about it, but just to say, I think that there is a justification for studying them, even though they have that. For example, they can tell you something about how to do perturbations, so what kind of perturbations you should make in order to make something happen. You can sort of learn about that by thinking about well, what's the probability that it happens spontaneously. That's a sort of familiar idea. Okay, there's, a lovely, there's lots of lovely theory about the entropy reduction rate and its large deviations. You can read these papers. Um, and then in this paper, just to briefly advertise it, uh, we identified the paths that lead to different non-typical values of the entry production rate. And this diagram shows the different kinds of paths that you get. And some of the paths are homogeneous densities, some of the paths correspond to traveling waves or phase separated states or collective motion where the particles line up and swim spontaneously in the same direction. And so Tao Lagrin did this calculation, it was like, I didn't think that he would ever manage, but he worked out everything. Uh, and he also found along the way this kind of peculiar singularity that happens at these points. OK, 
Okay, it's a big shadow. Right. So, what do I want to say? I think these systems of self-real particles, they're interesting to study from the physics point of view, a bit from the math point of view, maybe one day from the biological point of view. So here's some examples of the phenomenology, kind of phase separation, currents, velocity correlations. And then we quite like to put them on the lattice because then we can have exact results on the macro scale, uh, which is a nice thing to have. Um, I didn't say anything about, which I meant to say something about at the beginning, I didn't say anything about what happens if you have just one self-propelled particle. I think that's also interesting, by the way, even though I didn't talk about it. And maybe, especially for stochastic anomalous diffusion, that might be interesting. But whatever, I didn't talk about it. Uh, and then extensions, uh, what about mixtures? What about these bubbly phases? Uh, what about flocking? Uh, well, that's the question for lunch. Thanks for listening. Uh, any questions? Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, questions? Okay, so so uh, the way I would think about it, uh, where are we? The way I would think about it is that the, really the lambda is the activity. So the lambda is whether they self-propel. So the lambda says the minus guys like to go left, and the plus guys like to go right. So that's the self-propulsion, which for me is the activity. And then the gamma is what I would call the tumbling. So the gamma is the is the is the change of color or the change of direction. So they go, you know, they go, and then they change direction, and they go. Um, so it's like run and tumble, if you want. Okay, so if you set lambda to zero, it is a reversible Markov chain, and then it has invariant product measure, and everything is simple. Yes. Um, if you send gamma to zero, then... With gamma to zero, it's, it looks like an asset. Or yeah, so if you take gamma to zero, it looks a bit like these models of, like, so, okay, then it's a driven system, right? You have two species, and they're driven in opposite directions, and then you do get traffic jams in these driven systems where they block, and then you get this motility, so then you get this phase separation, uh, which looks a bit like this, but there's no bulk, actually. So, because the interfacial length, is it here? It's somewhere. This is the interfacial width, right? So, so what's happening here is that you get a, an excess of red, excess of blue, and a bulk region. And, this, and the interfacial width is the width over which you get an excess of red. So if you send gamma to zero, you don't have a bulk anymore. You just have a continuous reds go up, blues go down as you cross through the thing. So, so it's interesting. Um, interesting model, but different. So, um, what are the key differences to a passive droplet that is, say, sliding down the plane? Because there you would also have um, flows within the droplet. Mm. I mean, I mean, I guess there would be different flows. I mean. Uh, if you say the key difference is that there are flows, then also in this passive droplet side on a plane, you could have similar problems with the interfacial tension. So you're thinking of like an infinite inclined plane, and the droplet kind of dribbles down at the front of that angle, the back of that angle are different, and there's, yeah, there's work on this, isn't there? Um, well, okay, but you still know what the surface tension is. I guess the thing that's funky about these systems is that you, you really don't know what you mean by surface tension here. And that's, I think that's why it's different, for me at least. It's really an active fluid. So the interface, you know, even up here, even up here, what's going on is not equilibrium-like, whereas, well, it's different. I mean, sorry, I, yeah, it's different. I agree both situations are interesting. I also have a question about um, this case. What would the, um, it's quite high density in the like droplet. Mm -hmm. What would be in, do you have um, like collisions between the swimmers? Inside the droplet? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you should, the way you should think about the inside of the droplet is probably something like this. Okay. So it's not even that you have collisions, I guess they are just in contact. Okay. 
most of the time. So, the, so I didn't say anything about the, what the interaction potential was. So usually, because people like to do molecular dynamics on these fancy lamps, whatever, you take a soft, you don't take a hard disk, you take something with like a WCA. And so they always, you know, they're always slightly overlapping. If you think about them as, think about them as particles that don't like to overlap, but they don't wind a bit. So they're always slightly in contact. And that's what's going on. So that's probably why they're blue, is that they've got six neighbors that they're actually in contact with physically. Um, I mean, maybe you see it better actually in this movie. Then. But I, I mean, if you think about it like that, so we actually we did have a question in the paper, one of the papers about what's the collision time, but I think it's not a good, it's not the right thing to think about this because. Just a question on the uh, on the phase array you had uh, for the for the glasses system, you had a sliver, a little bit of region in between MIPS and your glass. Oh, yeah. glass. You call that an unusual fluid. Can you first tell us a little bit what's unusual about it? And secondly, do, do we know what's the infinite persistence limit? So, you know, you stop the diagram for, numer for numerical simulations at 10 to the 4, but I assume there's something that could be known analytically if tau p goes formally to the That's a great question. I get that question. Yes, yes. Sorry, I, I, I mean, I meant to emphasize this. So, so I think the surprise for us in this phase diagram is we kind of thought that this arrest line would meet the liquid line. And that doesn't happen, so we call this like the corridor. Uh, the little corridor between MIPS and whatever. Um, and all this interesting stuff that I spoke about with these velocity correlations, it basically happens inside this corridor. So you have to kind of fine tune in order to see the large length scales that I was talking about. Um, so so the, it's, it's unusual because it's, it's moving. So for example, the chaotic affection that I spoke about, that's happening in here because things are moving quite large distances over a long time, um, but in a very co co cooperative way because the, okay, the concentration is up near one, so, uh, so, so that's what's going on. Um, okay, and you might be wondering, okay, so then there is some subtlety here because I said up here you're saying tau to infinity at fixed d naught, and if you remember what d naught was, uh, Sorry, I'm, I'll stop in a minute. Um, so, so this prefactor here uh, is the is, this is the mean square length of the self propulsion force, and it's d naught over tau. So the strength of the propulsion is going to zero at the same time as the distance time is going to infinity, which is not necessarily the natural way to take the limit. Um, so, so that's to say that as you travel up here, you have the way we're thinking about it, you take the limit in a particular way. And the corridor may not be straight. The corridor may have a little bit of slope, so you may even have to take very far to take the limit and so on. And probably, oh, I don't know. So what people have done is something called ADD, a-thermal, oh lord, I can't remember. Anyway, there's, a, there's an algorithm where you basically update your orientations and then just run until everything stops. And then update your orientations again, run until everything stops. Keep doing that. And that gives you kind of a way to simulate this limit, this special limit that you refer to. And it's complicated what happens there. They call it extreme active matter in one of the papers. It, it, it's quite complicated. So, so first of all, there's an issue about there's more than one way to take that limit. And second of all, it's quite complicated to interpret the results of the simulation. But it may also not stop. So you may update your orientation, then it just flows and flows and flows. So um, I don't know of anything analytical. I think it's complicated. But it comes back a bit to this question, right? The, the, the previous question about the, about the kind of propagating. So if you have just two directions, maybe it's two directions and a lattice, it might be doable. But off lattice is quite complicated. We do have one paper with that. So we have um, a few minutes for more questions. I think this is good. I think Alessandro, you have Yes. So uh, you mentioned there is no way, or at least uh, nobody derived the active model B from uh, a microscopic, from a uh, cross grain. This is what you said. So, <laughs> exactly, I would say. Exactly. Exactly. So, so this is exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. But not done the way they demand. Okay. And, uh, and may I was curious if, if, 
EU or anybody, I guess, is on the deep side to use different choice of thematical parameters to have this sense of exploration, which makes the magnetization uh, uh, clear. From this. I have thought about it, and I always think that I'm making progress and that I'm making no progress. Um, yeah. I, I mean, Mike is the expert, right? You should really ask Mike or have coffee. But the issue with Acting Model B is it's got, it's got powers of the gradient, right? It's got gradient squared and gradient four. And the sort of stupid argument is, well, if you've got gradient squared and gradient four, well, you have to keep gradient six because it's not consistent otherwise. So if it wants to be exact, you've either got the first power only or no power. I think that's the sort of stupid argument. But let's discuss it over coffee. And, and if I'm wrong, I'm happy to be wrong. So just um, one last question, maybe it's a detail, but so in these in this phase diagram, you get it from simulations, right? How do you tell apart this unusual fluid phase and the boundary of the MIPS phase? Is it, is it just where you don't observe? So the boundary separate? of the MIPS phase is, okay, okay. I mean, I'm not, so this was, when was this? Not long ago. So we didn't sort of observe anything like a bubbly phase here. Um, so this red line is quite well defined, actually. It's just the density of the density. As long as there's no bubbly, that's fine. The blue line is always a bit fiddly. Defining that dynamical arrest is always a bit fiddly. So what we did was you just take some time and we say, if the relaxation time exceeds 10 to the power something, we'll call it arrested. So if we took a more stringent criterion for dynamic arrest, the blue line would move to the right. So for sure there is a corridor. Um, but there, I would say the red line is pretty well defined, blue line a bit arbitrary, but it can only go to the right. Really. And just to stop you, Rob, um, maybe more like an undergraduate question. So, so when we think of surface tension, we like to think there's a cost of forming an interface. If, if you, can you show the, the MIPS cluster again? So, so it's rough, right? It has a rough, uh, people look at the rough, roughness of the interface. And yeah, yeah, so it's, it's rough in a finite system. So, so even an equilibrium fluid would be rough in a finite system. And then um, maybe the question, which I, I don't know how to phrase it properly, but if I take a particle on the interface, and I remove it, how much work does that take? Is, that, is there an answer to that question? In an active setting? Uh, uh, well, none, right? Because the chemical potential is the same in both phases. I mean, um, so th that is the right, that's the right class of question. <laughs> For the surface tension, I think you want to ask the question, if I want to make the interface a bit longer, so if I want to turn it from a sphere into a slightly elliptical shape, that's the work that you want for the surface tension. But the, the issue is the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So the, so the <laughs> fluctuation dissipation theorem says that the shape fluctuations are ruled by the same work that it costs you to change the shape via a perturbation. And that's what's not true here. You don't have any fluctuation dissipation. So you have to separate the work required to change the shape from the spontaneous fluctuations of the shape. Okay, I think, um, I think the sorry, remaining questions have to ask Rob in the coffee. Yeah, I think he's done a good job of answering some questions. So yeah, thanks Rob. <laughs>